Good morning. Good to see everybody today. If you would be opening your Bibles to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. We're going to begin at the first verse. Well, as this is the last chapter in the book of Acts, I wanted to ask you all to be thinking about if there's anything in particular that you would like for us to study uh, after we finish this chapter. Uh, If not, we'll go right on into the book of Romans. Uh, But if anyone has any books or anything in particular that you would like for us to cover, uh, please speak with me this morning, either after class or uh, after services, and we will take a look at that. But as I said, if no one has any requests, we'll plan on going right on into the book of Romans when we finish Acts. Okay, before we start our class this morning, Dad, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Paul is on his way to Rome. He's on his way there to stand before Caesar, to stand trial. Up to this point, there have been several Roman officials that have heard his case, have found nothing wrong with Paul, have found no grounds to the charges that have been brought against him. But due to the fact that Paul saw his life at risk, He has appealed all the way to the highest court in the land. He's appealed all the way to Caesar. Well, as they were trying to get to Rome, going by ship, we find they ran into a lot of issues because of the time of year that they were trying to sail. They ran into a lot of weather events. We talked quite at length about some of that last week. And where we left off, they have wrecked the ship. They have run aground, the ship has fallen apart. Those who were able to swim, they swam to safety. Others who were not able to swim, the text tells us that they took hold of boards and other uh, pieces of the ship that were able to float and that everyone on board that ship was able to make it to safety. And so as we begin chapter 28, they have all made it to the shore. They are all on this piece of ground. You may remember we talked about last week that the weather conditions were so bad that they could not even tell where they were. So at this point, they have no idea where it is that they have wrecked. For a while, they were afraid that the winds were going to toss them as far away as the northern coast of Africa. So they don't know at this point where they're at. Well, as chapter 28 begins... It says, now when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. And so they found out now that they have not uh, arrived on the mainland. This is an island out in the middle of the Adriatic Sea where they have finally uh, come to a stop. You have all of these prisoners, all of these soldiers, you have the sailors. All of these people here are on this small island. They have all survived the shipwreck. But at this point, they're probably wondering what's going to happen now. They are in a spot that was not very well known as a place of trade. It was not known as a place where many large ships would uh, would visit. And so they're probably wondering... How are we going to get off of this island? Where, where are we going to go now? What's going to happen? Well, verse 2 says, And the natives, meaning those residents of the island of Malta, 
They showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. And so when the citizens of this island realize that this shipwreck has taken place, they realize that there are 276 people sitting on the shoreline with nowhere to go, they jump into action. They realize that there are certain basic needs that these individuals are going to have. From the text, it's still raining. We know that this was during a storm when the wreck took place. And so they come down and they build a fire. They do it in such a way that apparently the rain is not able to quench that fire. And they do this to try to help these individuals to keep warm. But we find that apparently some of these individuals, some of those who were in the shipwreck, were trying to assist those who were residents of the island in gathering wood and things that were needed. Because the next verse tells us that Paul went out and as he was gathering sticks, gathering a bundle of sticks for this fire, it says Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Probably many of us have had times where we've had brush piles, things like that, that we've let pile up for a while. Maybe we cut trees that were green and we had to let them lay for a while and, uh, and weather before they were able to be burned. And you go out and you light that brush pile on fire. A lot of times you'll see all kinds of animals come out of those piles. You'll see rabbits come running out. You'll see, uh, like this, you'll see snakes that will slither out of the fire. They're driven out because of the flames. Well, notice in this it says that a viper. A viper is a term that is still applied to some snakes today. We don't really see it as commonly used as it was in ancient times. But generally this term viper indicated a poisonous snake, one that was venomous. Well, Paul goes up, he lays his sticks on the fire. And we don't know if this viper comes out of the bundle of sticks that he was carrying or if it come out of the, uh, the pile itself. But it comes out and it attaches itself to Paul's hand. Well, all of those who were on this island, and remember, we talked about this some last week when we were talking about the sailors. This was a time of great superstition. This was a time before people understood a lot of the, the, the science and the biology and the, nat the natural processes that we see taking place in the world. There was a lot of superstition that went on in those days. Well, as the text tells us, all of these people are there. They see this snake come out of this pile and attaches itself to Paul's hand. Well, when they see this taking place, notice verse 4. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. So essentially they said, well, looks like this guy got what was coming to him. He must truly be a criminal. He was numbered among these prisoners. But notice in the superstitious nature that they had. They are looking at this as if this is fate coming about. Certainly he was worthy of death. But since he escaped death in the shipwreck, well, fate has now stepped in and he's going to die as a result of this snake bite. Well, what this tells me is that whatever type of snake this was, was one that was known as one that was highly deadly. It was one that people generally did not survive the bite of. And so they are there, they're seeing this occasion, and, and as soon as they see this, they think, okay, Paul is a dead man. 
He's not going to survive this. Fate has come about. Yes, his life was spared in the shipwreck. That had to have been a fluke. But now he has got what's coming to him. But notice the way that Paul reacts to this. The text says there in verse 5, But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. I don't know about you, but I think if a snake come out and attached itself to my hand, I think I would probably react a little bit stronger than that. I'm the type that if I even see a snake, I'm running the other way as fast as I can. But from the text, what what it seems to imply is that this snake comes out, bites him on the hand, he doesn't even give it a thought, he just shakes it off into the fire and keeps going with what he's doing. Well, of course, all of those who are there who are seeing all of this, they're just sitting there waiting and watching. They're probably keeping an eye on his hand, thinking, okay, his hand's about to start swelling up. We're going to see a reaction. His breathing is going to start to shallow. We're going to see some type of effect from this. But you notice the verse says that there was no harm. One of the sources that I looked at said that in one of the ancient texts that are out there, it said that there was an ancient commentator that had actually said that there was not even a fang mark on his hand. Meaning his skin was not even punctured. There was no harm that came to him whatsoever. Well, this was something that the people on the island, they knew that when you get bit by this type of snake, that just doesn't happen. So they're watching. They're waiting. They know that something bad's going to happen. But as we continue... Verse 6 says, however, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds, and now they're saying he is a god. You see the extremity they go to here? On one hand, they're so superstitious saying, you know, he's made the gods so mad, he's committed this heinous crime, that that fate has come about, he's going to die because he's a murderer. But now they're looking at this saying, he got bit by this poisonous snake? There's no indication that he got bit by this snake? He must be a god. Must be something divine about this man for this to not impact him in any way. And so, we notice that they're going to do something interesting. They're going to start talking about this. News is going to spread rapidly around the island. Of course, they're going to know about the shipwreck. Of course, they're going to know about all of these people that are there who are now uh, stranded upon this island. But you better believe they're also going to be talking about what they saw with Paul. Everybody's going to know, here's a man that got bit by a snake and it did not affect him at all. Well, as verse 7 says, that in that region there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And so here was a man who more than likely was uh, one of the more wealthy, prominent citizens there on the island. It says that he had an estate there on the island. He would have had the means to provide for these individuals. And so he invites them to come and, and stay with him. And he's providing for the needs of these individuals who were there, who were shipwrecked. Well, after they've been there for three days, word comes that Publius that his father is about to die. His father is sick. Notice it says here that he was sick of fever and dysentery. Well, these were two illnesses. Of course, we understand even more so today, fever is an indication of some type of infection. Oftentimes, uh, 
dysentery would be some type of gastrointestinal disease that they would have. And, of course, science has proven that that could be indicative of many different things. But in those days, it was all grouped under this heading of dysentery. He had an illness that was going to claim his life. It was an illness that they had not discovered a cure for. Well, the text goes on to say that Paul went into him and prayed, laid his hands upon him, and healed him. So now, we could say that two miracles have now taken place on this island directly connected to Paul. The first, he gets bit by a snake, and depending on how you want to interpret that, there's no visible sign of any kind of effects whatsoever from that snake bite. Now, here's the father of one of, if not the most prominent citizen on the entire island. They know that he's dying. Paul goes in, prays for him, and his health is restored. Do you think this is going to cause people to look at Paul and listen to Paul a little bit more? Okay, what's, what's going on with this guy? There's something special here. Well, of course, many of the people on the island are already thinking he's a god. Well, first off, this is really going to play into that belief, that misinterpretation on their part. But we notice it's not going to stop there. Because if we pick up then in verse 9, notice it says, So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So now Paul has performed more than two miracles. This text says that everyone on the island that was suffering with disease has now come to Paul, and Paul has essentially healed them in the same way that he healed the father of Pubulus. Through miraculous means, by praying for them, by laying his hands upon them, their health was restored. Verse 10 says, They also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. So after they've been on the island for a while, of course, uh, Paul has done a lot of good there. The text does not tell us that he did any preaching while he was there, but I'm sure he did. As we've seen in every other location that he's gone to, he took the time to tell people about Christ, to preach the gospel. I'm sure that that's something that he did while he was there. I'm sure that he told people uh, where the power of this healing was coming from. He wasn't going to let the people to let them continue to think he was a god. That was not something that he was going to allow to take place. And so I'm sure that there was some teaching that took place as well as these miracles. But after they had been there for a while, um, verse 11 is going to tell us that they stay three months there. Well, why did they stay three months there? We talked about it last week. It was the winter time. No, this was not where they wanted to spend the winter. They wanted to get to Phoenix. This was where they wanted to get to. There was a deep harbor there. There were plenty of supplies there. But we find that it turned out pretty well. They were provided for. Things went well. When it came time for them to depart to head on to Rome, the people there on Malta provided them with the necessities that they needed in order to survive that that. Uh, that additional journey. Well, verse 11 says, After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers which had wintered at the island. Now, we talked a little bit last week about Alexandria. Alexandria was a major city on the northern coast of Africa. It was a city that had a large harbor. <coughs> But also, Alexandria became a, a heavily influenced Christian base, I guess you would say, in the very early days of the church. 
Because what happened as the people in Jerusalem were starting to face persecution by Rome, a lot of those people departed and they scattered out in various directions. Well, many of them went down into Africa and settled at Alexandria. Historians have have documented the fact that there was a time that like 75 to 80% of the population of Alexandria were Christians. And this predated uh, Rome, uh, the, the rise in Christianity at Rome and other locations. There was a time where there were even more Christians in Alexandria than there were in Jerusalem. So Alexandria became a very key city in the very early days of the church. Well, when it came time for them to leave Malta to sail on to Rome, there was a ship there whose home was Alexandria. Now I've done some study to see if there's any kind of significance to this statement here, the twin brothers. Most people are saying that this is simply Luke's way of giving additional information You know, we talked some last week about the fact that Luke tends to be very meticulous in the details that he gives. Luke was a highly educated man. And of all of the writers that we see in the New Testament, Luke probably is the most meticulous at chronicling details of any. And so what most people agree is that this ship is simply known as the Twin Brothers that it does not have any type of special significance to that name, anything that would uh, have any type of Christian connection or anything like that, that he's simply giving us a detail that uh, is just giving us some additional information. So they get on this ship known as the Twin Brothers. It had been there on Malta. It had wintered there just as they had. And so whenever it came time to leave, this was the ship that they chartered to take them on to Rome. Well, verse 12 says, And landing at Syracuse, we stayed for three days. And from there we circled round and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and the next day we came to Puteoli, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with, excuse me, to stay with them for seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And so he's just showing us this progression of the way that they're going, the journey that they're taking. They visit a couple of places where they don't stay very long. Then finally one day the wind is blowing in the right direction. So they get as far as, uh, they get as far, <coughs> excuse me, as Puteoli. Well, when they arrive in this place, they are invited to stay for a week. Well, from the way that the text is worded, it sounds like that this was what they did, that this was kind of a layover. They stopped for a period of time. They spent some time with the brethren there. But then when they left Puteoli, they sailed directly for Rome. This was where their final destination was taking them. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appy Forum and three inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. If you ever look at a map of the country of Italy, you know Rome is not on the coast. Rome is pretty much dead center in the country. And so there were ports that people would have to get off and then they would have to travel along the roads to get to Rome. Well, what Paul is saying is that once they reached the mainland and the brethren in Rome heard that they were on the way, that they traveled out to meet them. And... From some of the sources that I looked at, it says that these two locations that are mentioned were about a day and a, a day to a day and a half journey from Rome. They traveled out on foot to meet Paul and those who were traveling with him. They were excited that Paul was coming. Even though he was coming as a prisoner, they were excited that Paul was finally going to be there. They knew that for a long time he had been wanting to come to Rome, and now he was finally going to be there. But notice the text says that when Paul saw them, he thanked God and he took courage. This text took courage. What this is indicating is that he realized that he had that moral support there. He realized that he was not going to be there 
facing these things on his own, that he was going to have support. And so he expresses his thanksgiving to God for these brethren and for the fact that they were going to be there with him to encourage him during his stay in Rome. All right. Anybody have any questions or comments up to this point? Anything at all? Okay, verse 16. Now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldiers who guarded him. Of all of the things that these soldiers, or with all of the things that these soldiers have witnessed on this journey, do you think that they were placing additional trust in Paul? Do you think they had come to realize that Paul was an innocent man? Yeah. Because notice he was not treated as the other prisoners were. When they arrived in Rome, the other prisoners, they were taken and put into prison. But not Paul. Paul was allowed to stay in a private residence along with his guards. So essentially, he was being treated in the same way that the guards were being treated. They had recognized that there was something unique about this man. There was something special about him, and they were showing this by the trust and the, the rights that they were extending to him that others were not receiving. Well, it came to pass, verse 17, that after three days, Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they had examined me wanted to let me go because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. So notice the first thing that he does. And this kind of plays into the tactics that Paul has used in all of his journeys. What was the first group that he wanted to visit with? The Jews. When he was on his journeys, where was generally the first place that he went when he went into a new city? Anybody? To the synagogue. He went to the place where the Jews were going to be. He recognized that it had been prophesied that the gospel was to be preached first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Now, I do not personally believe that that means that if he went into a location where there were Jews and Gentiles, he had to preach to the Jews first. I think that meant that the gospel was to be proclaimed the first time to the Jews first. And that's what took place there on the day of Pentecost. The gospel was preached to the Jews mainly for, for quite a period of time before we see the conversion of Cornelius. But we find that it was Paul's tradition. It was based upon Paul's nationality that he went to his people first. He went to the Jews. So now he's at Rome. He's been there for three days. Finally, he calls the Jews of the city together. And he tells them, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, Guys, I want you to know why I'm here. I want you to know what has transpired that has brought about me standing before you. He said, you know, he says, I've not done anything wrong, but the Jews in Jerusalem thought that I had. I was brought before the Romans. The Romans... Saw nothing wrong with me. But the Jews continued to press on. They wanted me dead. And I felt like my only choice was to appeal to Caesar. He said, and that's why I'm here. But I love the statement that he makes here. Because notice that he tells them. He says that he was there, and I'm paraphrasing... He was there because he was providing hope to all people. He says, I am bound in these chains. 
He says, right there, he says, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I called you to see you, to speak with you, because for the hope of Israel, I am bound in chains. He said, the things that I'm preaching, yes, I'm preaching to the Gentiles. He said, but this is the hope of Israel. If you want to please God, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to do these things. I'm here because I've been doing what God's Word instructs me to do. I'm bound in these chains because I've been providing hope. That hope that Israel had been searching for for so long, waiting on the Messiah to come. It's now available. Paul went out, he preached it, but now he's in prison because of that fact. Verse 21, then they said to him, We neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you, but we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. Something that I find interesting about this statement, and I think it really shows the mentality and the the purpose of, of the Jews who lived there around Jerusalem. When Paul left that region, when they carried him away to Rome, I honestly believe that those Jews thought we're never going to hear from Paul again. He's gone. We don't have to worry about him. And so as these Jews in Rome are saying, you know what, they didn't send us any kind of notification. They didn't tell us that that you were coming. We know nothing about what they've said that you've done wrong. He was out of their hair. He was no longer their problem. And so they were able to get on with life as they wanted to live it. So they weren't concerned with this anymore. But notice, and I think that this shows a little bit more openness to the Jews who were there in Rome. They said, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you have to say. They said, we've not heard anything in particular about you. But notice the way that the church is described. And this is what the Romans believed in the very early days of the church. This is what many of the Jews believed in the very early days of the church. They believed that Christianity was just another sect of Judaism. They believe, well, you got the Pharisees, you got the Sadducees, well, now you got the Christians that are going to all be lumped in under this heading of Judaism. And so these Christians in Rome, they say, well, this sect, this division, they said, we hear that it's spoken against everywhere. We're not hearing anything good about it at all. So we want to hear what you have to say. And so again, I think that that speaks worlds for the open-mindedness of these Jews in Rome. Those in Jerusalem, they didn't want to hear it. They had already made up their minds. But these Jews were at least open to hearing what he had to say. No, that doesn't mean that they were all going to agree with him. But they at least were willing to listen to what he had to say, to hear it from him. Not to just accept the things that they were being told. Well, we're going to stop right there. We've already got uh, several people out in the foyer, and we've got just a couple of minutes left. So I don't want to get into the rest of this text. Uh, So Lord willing, we'll finish up this chapter next Sunday morning. We'll look at... Some additional information I've put together on some things that kind of tie together uh, some of the things that took place after the writing of Acts, what took place with Paul once he arrived uh, there in Rome, what happened with this trial. We'll look at some of that additional information, and then the following Sunday we will pick up with a new study. And as I said, if anyone has any Uh, recommendations on things that you would like for us to study, please let me know. Uh, Otherwise, we'll go into the book of Romans.